we've got a man who was there watching the Clintons in the Clinton White House when Bill Clinton was president of the United States. And this book tells us some of the things that happened. It's called Crisis of Character. And uh, the Secret Service agent was there. Uh, well, he's had 30 years of experience in serving our country. And he will be talking to us in a few moments. Well, he says that the private Hillary Clinton was very different from what people saw in public. Jennifer Wishon has the story. As a uniformed officer in the Secret Service, Gary Burns stood guard outside the Oval Office while the Clintons served inside. It was his dream job, but Byrne witnessed things that led him to speak out in his new book, Crisis of Character. A White House Secret Service officer discloses his firsthand experience with Hillary, Bill, and how they operate. He details how Hillary belittled Secret Service officers on her detail, even throwing a Bible at one agent hitting him on the head. In front of cameras, he says the former first lady was warm and friendly, but outside the public eye, he says she was cold, emotional, and even dangerous. Byrne reveals he tried to keep Monica Lewinsky away from President Clinton and that he concealed other affairs the president had inside the White House, including one with Eleanor Mondale, the daughter of former Vice President Walter Mondale. Before she died, Eleanor suggested she and the president were just friends. And Clinton allies are also fighting back, saying Byrne didn't have the access that he claims. But as Hillary Clinton now seeks the White House, Byrne writes that from the bottom of his soul, he knows she lacks the integrity and temperament to serve as president. Well, former Secret Service officer Gary Byrne is joining us now from Washington. Gary, I want to ask you something. You know, I, I had that presidential thing, and I had a detail, and I did a lot of talking in front of those men, but I was under the impression that they had signed a non-disclosure agreement where they couldn't talk about that. How did you get free so you could talk? Well, first of all, good morning, sir. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, at the time that uh, I was in the Secret Service uh, Uniform Division, there was uh, not a non-disclosure disclosure agreement. And to be honest with you, um, I never thought I would be compelled to do this. Um, but as time went on in the last couple of years, I feel uh, it's, I feel I have to. I feel it's my duty to let the American people know what the truth is. Um, this woman's about to become president of the United States, and uh, I, I, I don't think it's a good thing. Based on what I saw in my years there, uh, I don't think it's a good thing. Clearly, I've um, made a decision to go forward and, and tell these things that, that normally wouldn't be told. But it's not the first time um, somebody from the Secret Service has done this. And I'd also like to point out that um, I wasn't the one that compelled me to, be, to testify. You know, it was President Clinton's behavior that brought myself and all these other Secret Service employees into this Monica Lewinsky scandal. It was their behavior that set this up. You know, you point out in here, and I remember very clearly, he held out and said, I have not had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. True? False. False. Uh, the testimony tells it. And, you know, when he made that statement, myself and the other officers and agents that knew they would be involved in this, it, it made us sick to our stomach because we knew they were going to drag us through this. Instead of the president doing the right thing and stepping forward and, and, and telling the truth, um, he decided to try to evade and ended up dragging everybody into this and, and making himself look very bad. Gary, I want to read something that's in here. I thought to, to set things up. Let's say it straight out. Hillary Clinton lied about the reason for the Benghazi attack. She lied about it to the nation as a whole, and she lied right in the faces of grieving family members uh, of those who died there, then lied about her lying. And she keeps telling Americans one huge, disgusting lie after another. As I wrap up writing this book, Hillary has claimed that, quote, we didn't lose a single person in Libya, unquote. Really? Try telling that to the families of the four men we lost on September the 11th, 2012. Not long before Mrs. Clinton committed this, that amazing, bizarre falsehood, the late Sean Smith's mother, Pat, broke down on national television, exclaiming, quote, Hillary is a liar. I know what she told me. Pat went on to say that she wanted to see Hillary in jail for her misdeeds at Benghazi. She's been lying. She's turned the whole country into a bunch of liars. 
Two decades ago, the late New York Times columnist William Sapphire wrote, Americans of all political persuasion are coming to the sad realization that our first lady, a woman of undoubted talents, who was a role model for many in her generations, is a congenital liar. That's a pretty strong indictment. You, you really believe that. I mean, you, you, you have firsthand, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples of her lying. Could you give us a couple of them? Well, the, the things I cite in my book, Crisis of Character, um, <laughs> is mostly about her behavior. But, but certainly, um, the, the case that you cite with Mrs. Smith, where, I mean, how do you tell a grieving mother one thing and then later on, she finds out the truth is, is something else. And at the same time that she's lying to, the, to this mother, she's texting other people and telling them what the truth is, that it was a terrorist attack. Um, that's the best example that, that I've seen recently. Um, other examples that I cite in my book, Crisis of Character, when I worked there, um, there's many of them. I, I can't think of one offhand right now. All right. Well, but um, there's many to, of them. Let's go to something you did notice. There was a vase, apparently the... White House is like a museum with all these treasured artifacts. And you heard a crash, and a vase was smashed, thrown by Hillary at her husband, correct? Could you tell us about well, that? Well, that's uh, not exactly the okay. way. I came, in, I came in to work one morning, Pat, and um, I was talking to my coworkers, and they were telling me that there had been a, a big fight upstairs. And uh, I know this sounds a little voyeuristic, but you have to put it in context. The White House is very old. There's big stairwells, elevator shafts, and, the, and they were yelling so loud the sound came down. And during this fight, they heard a crash. When it was investigated, they found somebody found a, a broken vase. Now, this has been reported as a broken lamp or, or something else, but it was a, a vase. Because shortly after my friend told me the story, I walked over to the White House curator's office, looked inside, and there was the broken vase in a cardboard box. And based on the reaction of the curator that was in there, I was sure that that's exactly what I was looking at. Are, and, well, you, you talked about the fact that this was a relationship of deceit, that when they were close together, they didn't touch, they didn't uh, embrace, they weren't kissing, they weren't close. Yet before cameras, suddenly they're holding hands and hugging. And uh, was it all a charade? Is that what you were saying? I think to a certain extent. I mean, I, I wasn't... Don't get me wrong, I didn't live up in the private living quarters with them. But when I saw them, what you might call private, like, you know, walking around the complex or, or, refer, or talking to each other, yeah, it didn't seem, it seemed like a business relationship at best. Well, what about uh, uh, her? I mean, did she ever talk to you? You, you mentioned that she threw things at one of the Secret Services. I understand she hit somebody over the head of the Bible. Was it was, you know, on the way to church or something? Was that what happened? Yeah, so one uh, morning I was standing post and with an agent outside the Oval Office. And I said to him, I, I heard somebody got hit with a Bible. What happened? And he said, it was me. And he said he was on the south grounds in the limousine. He was driving. The first lady was sitting behind him. And, and for some reason, she was irate about something. And she had a Bible in her hand. And she struck him in the back of the head with the Bible for some reason. And um, he... It made him very mad. He turned around and he made it very clear to her. He turned around the best he could sitting in that car. And he uh, just described to her that that wasn't going to be acceptable behavior. And um, he reported it up the chain of command. But basically their attitude with this kind of thing is that's the way she is. That's what's going to happen. It's not the first incident and it won't be the last. Well, talk about this explosive thing. Would, would, what would set her off in terms of anger? Was it... Uh trivial things or major thing? Well, to me, they were trivial things. I mean, if you're going to work at that level in the government, you really have to have a, <clears throat> you really have to have a perspective of what's important. And what's important is people's lives and protecting your country. Here's an example, uh, a good example, Pat, is um, one morning I was going to get some information for a tour, and uh, I was up in the social office which traditionally is where the First Lady works. And there was three women up there that worked with Mrs. Clinton. These were co-workers and friends from Arkansas. And they were having this discussion. And they, they, they seemed very agitated, to the point where I actually thought something was wrong. I asked if somebody was sick, if there was something wrong. And they said, no, that there had been a mistake made by an intern ordering these invitations for the White House. And the invitations were useless. And their, their anxiety was not that the invitations were useless and that they, somebody wasted all this money. 
they were terrified to have to tell who was going to tell the first lady that a mistake had been made. And that, that always stuck with me. I'm like, this is somebody you're working for all these years, and you're terrified to tell her that a mistake made, was made. Well, it's, just, it's just, and as time went on, I saw many examples of this. Well, give us some more of them. What else? Well, the, well <laughs> the example that we just talked about, about the agent being struck with the Bible, and then another time I was um, asked to do a tour of the uh, Oval Office, my uh, old post, for some guests of the Clintons from Arkansas. And this staff member wanted to bring them over and leave them in the Oval Office, and which is not acceptable. Th there's many l rules and guidelines that dictate how people, um, when the president's not in the Oval Office, how the staff or the family can go in and go out of there. So I explained to the staff member that um, it, what she wanted to do wasn't possible, but she could escort them and then take them across the hallway to the Roosevelt Room. So um, she said this wasn't acceptable, and the staff member berated me, and I'm going to tell Mrs. Clinton. And I, I got to tell you, as I'm retelling the story again, it just seems so childlike. But uh, so a little while later, the first lady comes down and she berates me and um, uses some, you know, a little bit of harsh language and tells me they're tar she's tired of dealing with us. And, and I tried to explain to her that these are rules and guidelines that are set in law. And uh, I would try to accommodate her. And after she berated me a, a little bit more, I finally, you know, said, listen, just when your guests are done in the Oval Office, um, you can put them in the, I'll put them in the Roosevelt room and that'll be the end of it. Um, but the, these were, these interactions with her, with my coworkers were, um, there were many others. Um, I have a couple more if you had the time. Go ahead. I'm listening. Sure. Was, um, two officers, um, they were pretty new to the job. They've been on about a, at least a, a, about a less than a year. And, um, one morning I was in a break room and one of the officers came down and, uh, he said, um, Today's a weird day. I said, uh, how's that? And he said, well, the, um, I just said hello to the first lady, and, and she told me to go to, to, go to hell. And, um, you know, I, we kind of looked at him, and we said, well, you know, you're going to get used to that. She's, she seems hostile towards us. She, she doesn't, you know, we told him our opinion, what we experienced was she didn't seem to like the military or law enforcement. So as we're talking, another guy comes over, and he goes, that's nothing. He said, uh, a month ago, I said good morning to her, and she told me to go myself. And um, so a sergeant overheard us, and um, he reported it up the chain of command, and this, the senior people in the Secret Service took it pretty serious. They came over, they talked to him about it, they apologized, but they explained to him basically the same thing we had told him, that the First Lady was kind of hostile towards us at times, and... Uh, that's the way it was. Well, she used that, wanted, that kind of language. You're talking about the F word. She used that. Yes, sir. Uh, dressed him and told him to go blank himself. Yes, you sir. You know, people now, don't talk that way. Certainly the no. first lady of the United States. Listen, I, I don't mind if people use Saudi language, but why would you say that to the man that has been up all night protecting you? Yeah. And, and another significant thing about that story, the second person I was describing Three years before that, he was a veteran in the U.S. He was in the U.S. Army, excuse me. And um, he was on a mission in Somalia, uh, early on in Somalia. Not like we would, today you would think is what we would call Black Hawk Down, but this was before that. And he, he received a Purple Heart for being wounded. And three years later, he gets a job with the Secret Service, and the First Lady of the United States tells him to go F himself. I'm sorry, that's never acceptable. The... Uh big thing in this book has to do with the cover-up uh, and this Monica Lewinsky, this young girl, 20 years old, 21, whatever, however old, 19, however, you know, whatever. Right, she was, she was 21 or 22. 21, okay. Well, she was trying to get in, apparently, and what you had in there was so shocking that there's a secret telephone number with all kinds of codes associated with it, only for the President of the United States. And Bill Clinton gave Monica Lewinsky that number. Tell us about that. Yeah, I believe so. And um, so here's how it happened. One morning, and at this point, as things were happening, I still gave, tried to give the president the better of the doubt. Even though um, what I saw led me to believe that these things were going on. And some of the Secret Service agents would tell me, Gary, you know, when we're on the road, you don't know what goes on sometimes. So one Saturday morning, Monica Lewinsky um, showed up at the... Oval Office. She was still an intern at the time, and she um, she tried to deliver a stack of papers, which is basically news clippings. And on this Saturday, there was no staff in yet, 
So she came up and she said, I had to deliver this, which was ridiculous. Um, first of all, the president had two copies of what she had already because I put them in the Oval Office that morning when I opened the, opened the office up. So, um, you know, I told her that she, you know, she shouldn't be here and she left. Well, about five minutes later, she, um, I'm sorry, about five minutes later, the, the Oval Office door opens up and the president comes out with this kind of grin on his face and he says, Hey, officer, have you seen um, anybody trying to del deliver something to me? And I said, uh, uh, well, sir, um, if I do, I'll let you know. And he kind of smiled at me and he shut the door. So um, I looked at the agent and he said, uh, Gary, you just, you just don't know what's going on. So that's when I kind of came to the conclusion that, that these rumors were true. So a short time later, um, Monica showed back up and she um, went into the Oval Office. I knocked on the door and I let her, let her in. So when she showed up the first time, she would have had to go and call him. I know she went into the West Lobby and made a phone call. So she had to have called the president. And then you just can't pick up the phone and get the president. You have to call on that line, unless you're the chief of staff. But uh, she was not. And um, that's what I testified to in my testimony when I was compelled to testify uh, by subpoena uh, six times. You, there's a heart-rending story in here about a Navy chief, I guess he's Filipino, who loves this country and loves the office of president. And he had to do some unsavory business with uh, dirty linen. You want to tell us about that? Sure. One day, uh, standing my post outside the Oval Office, the Navy steward, Nell, uh, came up to me. And I could tell he was a little distraught. And he said, you know, Burn, I'm, I'm tired of cleaning up this mess. And I, I saw what he had in his hand, towels, and, and, um, and uh, I kind of knew what he was talking about. And uh, so I decided to, um, and at this time, we had no idea there was an investigation going on. So those towels would have gone right to the Navy mess, and they would have washed them. And those guys know where the towels come from. And, you know, they're, they're um, men in the military. They know what that stuff looks like on towels. So... Um, I decided it was best to get rid of the towels to try to protect the president's reputation. Uh, I, the last thing he needed at this point was another scandal. So I grabbed the plastic bag, I had Nell throw them in there, and I destroyed the towels. Well, sometime later when the Star investigation uh, started subpoenaing us, I was, I was afraid that I, that might be considered uh, destroying evidence. But luckily it wasn't. So you're talking, these are hand towels with, with the president's semen on them that were going into to the wash and the poor guy the, the mess uh, chief was just distraught that that was the way the yes. president was acting. Yes. And, and you know, um, a couple of people have come out and uh, tried to discredit my story, saying that what I've just said to you was different than my testimony. I would just like to clarify that there was different incidences. There was incidences with hand towels, with tissue, and I only testified to what they asked me. I couldn't tell them everything. There were so many rules and so many lawyers involved in this when it was happening, it, it's mind-bottling. When you read, if you get a chance to read my book, Crisis of Character, you, you'll see that. How many women were involved with, with uh, Clinton during that time? Do you have any idea? I do not. I, I know of three incidences that I testified to, and, uh, but I have no idea. Well, you had one thing in your book where Monica was trying to get in to see him, and he was in having sex with some other woman at, at the time, and you couldn't open the door? Well, uh, to, to clarify, I was standing post outside the Oval Office, and he was meeting with somebody, but um, I, I believe it was like a legitimate meeting. Mm. Now, what you're describing is, at the same time, Monica Lewinsky was outside at the Northwest Gate trying to get in, and his president's secretary, Betty Carey, was trying to keep her outside until this meeting was over with this other person, because she didn't want them to cross paths. Mm. And uh, Betty told the officer at the gate, who was um, in there. And the officer mentioned it out loud. And when Monica heard this, she got very upset. And she actually made the statement of something to the effect that you, she, he's in here with her when he has this out here waiting for him. And the officers uh, that told me the story, it, it was so bizarre to them. They, uh, it was like we were living in an alternative world. Gary, what did Mrs. Clinton, Hillary Clinton, know about her husband? She must have known a lot about it. Did, did she display anger? Did you hear her screaming about you philandering so-and-so, how could you kind of thing? I never heard that 
per se. But I will tell you that um, based on the reports I remember at the time and, and what I know from my coworkers at the White House, the first time that she heard that the Lewinsky thing was real was when the president's attorney went over and told her. And I noticed a huge change in, in her demeanor for a while. Like, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word depression, but she seemed very angry and sad. And, and who could blame her? But let's face it, from what we know now, that this wasn't the first time, and all those rumors from Arkansas are probably true. Um, based, on, based on what I saw, I think it was. So this wasn't her first time with this. Um. You have said in your book you don't think she's got the character to be president. Do you want to expand on that one? Yes, sir. I think the best example, although this isn't actually in my book, um, she doesn't have the character, and I'll use this as an example. When she was Secretary of State, we had the incident in Benghazi. Somebody with character, somebody who was a real leader, would have stayed on as Secretary of State and took the steps and put procedures in place that would never let that happen again. Instead of shifting blame, making up lies, and, and telling the families lies, and then just moving on and starting to run for president. A leader fixes things and gets it right and then moves on. You don't have any knowledge of the Clinton Foundation or the various uh, money that has come uh, to them from foreign sources. You, you know anything about that? No. Or? That's just know what I, I just know what's been reported, sir. Okay. Well, Gary, we, we appreciate this, and uh, I'm sure your your book's going to be a bestseller already. I think on Amazon. And uh, well, thank you. It's called Crisis of Character, and appreciate it. it was courage to come out and say what you said. And there's a lot more, ladies and gentlemen, in this book. So, um, what do you think? Wow. Thank, thank you. you, sir. I appreciate thank it. You. Well, uh, you know, I'm sure that. Some of this could be recounted by others who were oh, in yeah. service there at the same time. And honestly, I mean, I don't think anybody's really surprised. Maybe we don't know the details of it, but you can't see the things you've seen mm -hmm. happen and not question the character. Well, of how could the American people want that kind of thing again? We had eight yeah. years of it. You know, I, I have said so many times that the people most recently that I am most compassionate about are the parents of those men in Benghazi. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just can't imagine. We saw that picture of, of Mrs. Clinton and the president and a few others sitting around a table watching, mm. you know, video played out of well, what happened. The, the, and you just go, how does somebody she do that? She emailed a relative that this was a terrorist attack going on in Libya. At the same time, she is instructing her agent to go before the American people and talk on all those Sunday talk shows and say it was because of a uh, anti-Muslim video on on cable, which was nonsense. So was, but she said it was a, a, a conf, you know she just lied about it. Well, maybe the most stinging thing to me was when she had to testify a while after yeah. that to make a statement like, "What difference does it make now?" Yeah. yeah was just so incredibly insensitive. It kind of took your breath away a little bit. Well, this is what's going on. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the book. It's called A Crisis of Character. There's a whole lot more in here that we didn't get a chance to talk to. But Gary uh, was there. And uh, as the Secret Service, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he a lot of it is what his fellow officers told him and what he saw and what he didn't see. But anyhow, yeah. OK, Terry. You know, the thing is, I think people are some of them expressing concern about we don't know what we're getting with Donald Trump. But on the other hand, you do know what we you're know getting. what we're getting with <laughs> okay. Mrs. Clinton. Okay. So What's there that? you go.